Here we go. Call this meeting the Williamsburg Jane City County School Board to order. Welcome everybody to, on this uh, beautiful December day to uh, the Williamsburg Jane City County Recreation Center. Um, can I get Ms. Holler? Can you take the roll, please? Mr. Dowell. Here. Ms. Hummel. Here. Ms. Ellenby. Here. Mr. Kelly. Here. Uh, Dr. Beers is on his way. Uh, Mrs. Cook is, will get her on board, on board shortly. Uh, Mrs. Young is not feeling well and will not be joining us today. Can I get a motion to allow Mrs. Cook to attend the meeting via electronic or telephone communication? Mr. Yes. Chair, I move that we allow Ms. Cook to attend the meeting via electronic communication. Thank you, Mr. Dowell. Second. Any discussion? Ms. Aller? Mr. Dowell. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Ms. Ellenby. Aye. Mr. <laughs> Kelly. Aye. Thank you, Mrs. Hummel. <laughs> Motion carries. Mr. Hipple. Thank you. All right, I call the meeting of the James City County Board of Supervisors to order. Ms. Stevens, you call the roll, please. What, sir, Mr. McGlennon. Here. Ms. Larson. Here. Mr. Eisenhower. Here. Mr. Ripple. Here. President. All right, I need a motion to allow Ms. Sadler to participate remotely due to medical reasons that prevent her from attending in person. So moved. So moved. Ms. Second. Ms. Stevens, you call the roll. Mr. McGlennon. Aye. Ms. Larson. Aye. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Mr. Ripple. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Mayor. Good morning. Thank you. Um, Ms. Felipe, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Rogers. Ms. Ramsey. Here. Here. Mayor Fox. Here. Vice Mayor Depp. Here. Mr. Maslin. Here. And may I have a motion to um, approve Mr. Maslin, Mr. Rogers to pr um, participate in the meeting remotely? So move. Ms. Ramsey. Aye. Mayor Aye. Vice Mayor Aye. All right, so um, next item on our agenda is a presentation of the superintendent's proposed fiscal year 23-32 capital improvement plan. Uh, Dr. Heron is here. Miss Ewing, I think, is still sitting in James City County down there, but it might be York or New Kent. I'm not sure which, but she's a long way down there. So, uh, Dr. Heron. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Kelly, Sports School Board members, Mayor Pond, City Council members, Chair Hipple, Board of Supervisor members. Thank you for the opportunity to present the superintendent's proposed capital improvement plan for fiscal year 23 through 32. As background to our presentation this morning, you will recall that in 2018, the City Council, the Board of Supervisors and School Board each approved a resolution that stated that we would start discussion of the need for additional space by level when at 85% capacity and take action at 90%. In addition, we would review annually the utilization of student enrollment projections to determine our approach to planning. Prior to 2018, the division used the most likely enrollment for planning due to very slow growth in 2018. We determined to use the low projection and used it for two years. Last year, we were in a very unusual situation with the pandemic significantly impacting enrollment. Due to the uncertainty, we used the moderate projection <clears throat> in predicting the return of students. In reality, this year, we exceeded the high projection with the majority of the increase at the elementary level. Prior to the presentation, let me give some highlights. Last year, the school board and their approved CIP moved the request for an elementary school back by two years to fiscal year 24 and 25 to allow time to assess how quickly students would return to WJCC schools following the pandemic. The September 30 data shows a return of 142 students at the elementary level. In reality, we've had 30 more students enrolled since, September, since the September 30 count, and they were at the elementary level. Based on the enrollment increase in one year, we have moved the request for pre-K through five space up again in the timeline, design in 23 and construction in 24, 25. When the school or space would open, Overall, elementary school capacity with pre-K, based on moderate projection, would be at 96%, and, and at high projection, it would be at 99%. Currently, we have trailers at all element, elementary schools except Matoka, 12 in total, with Stonehouse having six classrooms and three trailers today. 
We have again pushed back the request for additional high school classroom space out beyond the five-year plan based on flat enrolment projections for the next 10 years. We will continue to monitor that need. Note it is still above 90%, but we have the variable of virtual learning for a small number of students. We were very pleased to be able to give back over $5 million to our funding partners, partners from last year to support our capital needs and have applied for a, a grant, a federal grant of $2 million to support the Berkeley HVAC project already approved in the five-year plan. We, it's gone through a preliminary analysis and has got approval at the first level and we're quite hopeful that that money will actually be approved. At this point, Ms. Ewing, Chief Financial Officer, will take us through the presentation that focuses mainly on fiscal year 2023. Thank you very much, Ms. Ewing. Thank you, Dr. Herring. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Each year, the school division adopts a 10-year capital improvement plan to project and plan for future needs and to allow for adequate time and opportunity to prepare and budget for those needs. This morning, we will be sharing with you a summary of the superintendent's proposed capital improvement plan with a focus on the first five years of the plan, fiscal years 23 through 27. Before we share information about the CIP plan, I think it's important to look at our enrollment from last year and how it compares to our enrollment for this year. Our September 30th, 2020 enrollment was 10,858. And based on this, our projection for this school year ranged from a low of 10,729 to a high of 11,016. We actually ended up slightly over the high projection for this year at 11,018. The majority of the increased enrollment, as Dr. Heron mentioned, is at the elementary level, which was 142 students. Our projected enrollment for next year ranges from a low of 10,892 to a high of 11,166. Regarding the pandemic, the low projection assumes that it continues into the 22-23 school year and has continued impact on enrollment. The high projection assumes the pandemic is under control by the end of the current school year and has little to no impact on enrollment. The moderate projection assumes the pandemic is under reasonable control by the end of this school year and has some impact on enrollment. And the most likely remains between the moderate and high projection. We know that the school board and the localities agreed to utilize the low projection for planning purposes, but we believe that last year and this year are anomalies due to the pandemic. We've utilized the moderate projection last year for planning purposes and are continuing to do so this year. As we review projects within the plan, I will share the school capacity as it compares to the moderate projections and the impact on projects within the superintendent's proposed CIP. The estimates for projects in the capital improvement plan include 10% for architecture and engineering services, 5% for contingency, and an annual escalation rate of 3% per annum. This table shows future things moderate projected enrollment as it compares to the division's capacity for high schools. <coughs> Lafayette is currently at 86% capacity, or 1,126 students, and is projected to remain around 85% for the next 10 years. Jamestown is currently over capacity at 1,240 students, or 102%, and is projected to remain at that level through the next 10 years. War Hill's current enrollment is 1,327 or 92% capacity and is projected to remain at that level through the next 10 years. Overall, high school capacity is at 93% for the current year and is expected to remain stable over the next 10 years. As part of our fiscal year 21 spending plan, funds for the design of the Jamestown cafeteria expansion were approved, so you will see a request for the construction funding in fiscal year 23, as well as construction funding for the renovation of the 900 building at Lafayette. Based on the enrollment at the high schools remaining con consistent over the next 10 years, the classroom expansions at Jamestown and Warhill are being moved out another year from fiscal years 27 and 28 to fiscal years 28 and 29, so both are outside of the five-year plan. We will continue reviewing this each year. 
This table shows Future Think's moderate projected enrollment as it compares to the division's capacity for middle schools. Overall, middle school capacity is currently at 82.3% and doesn't reach 85% until fiscal year 30. Based on the projected middle school enrollment for the next 10 years being on average 84% and not yet reaching the 90% capacity overall where action needs to be taken, phase two of James Blair would be in fiscal year 33 or later. This will be reevaluated each year as updated enrollment data is available. During the past budget cycle, we reviewed our class size targets and adopted these class sizes for elementary schools based on free and reduced lunch percentages, which maintains a 20 to 1 ratio for grades K through 2, 23 to 1 for grade 3, and 25 to 1 ratio for grades 4 and 5 at all schools except James River, which has a ratio of 19 to 1 at all grade levels. Because classroom usage can change from year to year, we have reviewed the elementary effective capacity to ensure it is in line with these established ratios. This table shows the elementary moderate projected enrollment with pre-K added. Overall, we are currently at 92.6% capacity. Norge is at 97% capacity, and Matthew Whaley and Stonehouse are both at 100% capacity. All elementary schools have trailers except for Matoka to assist with space needs. Trailers are not reflected in the effective capacity in this table as they are a short-term solution to address space needs. Overall, the division will be at 96% capacity in fiscal year 25 and is expected to increase each year to 101% in fiscal year 30. Because enrollment came in this year right at the high enrollment projection for the year and the majority of the increase in students was at the elementary level, we are also sharing the effective capacity chart reflecting the high projection for next year, again with pre-K added. This shows that in fiscal year 24, we will be at 95% capacity overall, increasing each year to 102% capacity in fiscal year 27. Enrollment at the elementary level has begun to recover from the pandemic with the addition of over 170 students so far this year. Trailers are currently located at all elementary schools except for Matoka, and the grant funding being utilized for the lease of those trailers will expire in September 2024. The annual lease cost amounts to approximately 210,000, which would need to be incorporated into our operating budget in fiscal year 25. Based on this information, we have placed design in fiscal year 23 for a pre-K to five space in construction in fiscal year 24. Since funding is appropriated annually, our focus is really on the next fiscal year. In addition to the changes I shared previously regarding the Jamestown cafeteria and Lafayette 900 building renovation, there are some cost increases to the walk-in refrigerator freezer projects at Matthew Whaley and James River, as well as the gutter replacement at Laurel Lane. These increases amount to approximately 220,000. Modifications to the 10-year plan not previously discussed include the following. Based on the CIP committee's recommendation to change the replacement cycle for tile to 20 years, these projects have been separated from the paint and carpet projects at DJ Montague, Blayton, and Matoka and placed in the corresponding fiscal year based on the new 20-year cycle. Additional school buses are typically added when new facilities are built and with the design and construction of a pre-K to five space in fiscal year 23 and 24, funds for additional buses are included in fiscal year 26. Additions to the 10-year plan based on our established refurbishment and replacement cycles include gym refurbishments at Matoka, Lafayette, and Warhill, auditorium refurbishments at Matoka and Warhill, paint and carpet at James Blair, auxiliary gym HVAC replacement at Jamestown, and tennis court replacement at Warhill. Other additions to the 10-year plan include bus canopies at Norge and Hornsby, a weight room renovation at Jamestown, office expansion and paint and carpet at operations, and a centralized storage space. We have also maintained funding for parking lots, sidewalks, and playground equipment in year 10 of the plan. 
For several years, a new central office has been connected to the need to expand James Blair to accommodate for middle school growth and has been in years nine and 10 of our plan. This year, a space needs analysis was conducted by Mosley Architects for James City County, which shows our space needs currently and over the next 20 years. This chart from Mosley's presentation shows that central office and operations currently occupy approximately 63,000 square feet, through, though our current need is closer to 66,000. In 2025, our need is just over 70,000 square feet, and in 2030, our space need is estimated to be just over 75,000 square feet. Based on this space needs study, we are keeping a new central office in our 10-year plan in 2030 for design and 2031 for construction. For the five-year CIP plan, HVAC and window projects account for 22% of the total, or 15.2 million. As Dr. Heron mentioned, we have applied for a grant with the Department of Education for funding to support the Berkeley HVAC replacement. Um, our allocation under that grant is 2.2 million, and if approved, this would allow local funding already planned for this project to be used to support other projects. Roof replacements, school refurbishments, and renovation projects account for 11% of the total five-year budget, or 7.2 million. And projects grouped into the other category include items such as walk-in refrigerator, freezer replacements for cafeterias, generator replacements, and electrical repairs, as well as division-wide projects such as parking, brickwork, and playground equipment. The total cost estimated over the next five years is 8.6 million, or 13% of the total. The total cost for construction is estimated at 37 million, which is 54% of the five-year total for capital improvements. And the superintendent's recommended five-year plan totals 67 million 921,000. And some of the projects, some of the major projects in fiscal year 23 are the construction funding for the Jamestown cafeteria expansion, renovation of the 900 building at Lafayette, and the design of a new pre-K to five space. Fiscal year 24 contains the construction of a new pre-K to five space and HVAC replacements at Matthew Whaley in fiscal year 25 and Stonehouse in fiscal year 26. This concludes our presentation. Thank you for consideration of the CIP, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. So um, anything else you want to add, Dr. Heron? Uh, no, sir, not at this time. So um, <clears throat> I think we know all, we all know the one issue that we're going to talk about. But before we got to by, talk about that, does anybody have anything to talk about anything else in the CIP besides the pre-K through five space? I just have a question sure. about the Lafayette with the um, with the opening of the 900 building, are, are those numbers incorporated into your capacity for that, or is that going to free more capacity there? Uh, basically, once the 900 building is re refurbished and redone with classroom space, it will increase the capacity of Lafayette. Okay, so it's not figured in those? It's, it is not configured. Okay. Jim? Yeah, I had uh, one question about the, the, uh, the funding um, for design in 23 and uh, construction in 24 of the pre-K uh, pre through 5 facility. It totaled about 30, 31, 32 million dollars. Um, how does that reflect with, you know, I'm, I'm sort of curious as to, as to how that number was arrived to put into the CIP versus what we've gotten in the little handout from you, which shows that if you were to build. Uh, so, so Jim, I was trying to get through all everything else. But no, no, I'm, got to I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just talking about, you know, this, this, is, this is a number that, that appears to be a soft number in your, in your, in your CFA. Can you okay. explain to me, you know, why that particular uh, figure was chosen and how, how you think that the discussion that we're going to have might, might affect that? Yeah, we've actually worked very hard to update some numbers this week based on our current reality. And I'm going to ask Mr. Keever, Mr. Snipes, whoever wishes to take it, to, to talk about 
the how we came to the initial figure that's in the CIP okay. for which was originally for an elementary, then we turned the terminology to pre-K through five space. Uh, how we came about that number, which I think was based mainly on, a, on an analysis of buildings that have happened in the last number of years. Mr. Kiefer. Yes, yes ma'am. Dr. Heron, that is correct. That, that number has been in our CIP uh, for the last several years. Um, and as we understood that we needed to probably look more specifically at some pre-K space based on discussions within the body, we went back and talked with uh, architectural firms and, and really re-crunched what those potential numbers could look like moving forward or if the time frame were needing to be compressed. So there's the, the holding place right now for that elementary or that pre-K five space. But I think the numbers we presented to you or Dr. Heron presented to you last evening um, are, are a more accurate reflection of what it may cost if we were able to build today. Okay, that, that answers my question. I just was curious as to why, why there was that uh, significant discrepancy and I didn't know whether, you know. Uh, <clears throat> both both on, our, on analysis but a different form of analysis and really trying to bring us right up to speed for what it would cost today to build these okay. particular buildings, cost per square foot today, which is different from it was two years ago. Thank you. John, uh, could I just ask one question about uh, the um, change in enrollment as a result of COVID? Uh, obviously, we know we saw a drop in, in enrollment in the school system uh, due to the um, uh, choices that parents were making related to COVID uh, and perhaps related factors. Uh, but uh, I'm just kind of curious as to if we know um, what, uh, how those students are now being educated, uh, what's the mix between transfer to uh, private institutions, uh, uh, homeschooling, whatever else might be out there. I don't know if we have any uh, feel for that, but uh, we'd be interested in knowing if you do. We do have the numbers and we can get that for you, Mr. McLennan, uh, and for, for everyone in the room. We've looked at it several times with the school board and uh, I mean, a lot of students have started to come back this year, obviously. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Ms. Larson. Thanks. I just had one follow-up. I apologize for not asking it before. With your um, administrative space needs, I know your school, so it, you, I'm assuming most of your central office is in every day, but I just wondered if you'd had any uh, that continued to work from home, if there were any of your positions that were able to do that, um, or is everybody back in? <coughs> Everyone has been in person uh, for a long time now, all okay. of this year. Okay, thank you. Any other comments about the rest of the CIP? Anyone else? Uh, this is Ted. Office? I have a question. Awesome. Go ahead, Ted. Uh, so, general CIP question Can you remind us uh, what's the, the threshold for moving from a maintenance project to a CIP project? and is there any indication that um, we maybe don't have enough uh, funds or attention to maintenance that's driving some of these projects that then become uh, major major repairs? Mr. Snipes may, may be able to address that. We do maintain our buildings at a, a very high level. Uh, most CIP projects, from my understanding, and Mr. Snipes can confirm, are on a replacement cycle with the end of life of, of particular pieces of equipment like HVAC. Mr. Snipes, do you want to just join us on that one? Um, good, at, good morning, everyone. Yes, the threshold for capital improvement projects is $50,000. Most of our projects are replaced on a useful life. Um, as Dr. Heron said, HVACs are every 20 years, um, including um, parts of a geothermal system that we have at other locations. So um, we recently have reviewed our refurbishment cycles for tile and paint and carpet and we recognize that they last a little longer because of the maintenance that we've been having on those things. So we've increased the maintenance um, and we've increased the life cycle for tiles. Does that answer your question? Uh, that's good. Uh, and in particular for the roof systems, uh, do we have an aggressive uh, maintenance program for the roof systems and the flashings? Yes, uh, we do. We have a we have a maintenance program for our roofs. Most of our roofs are under warranty um, for at least ten to twelve years, and um, metal roofs are replaced every thirty years. 
Um, TPOs are replaced every 20. And when I say TPO, it's the flat roofs that you guys see on buildings. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other comments about CIP? <clears throat> That's by the bad part of the CIP. So then we then we get to, I guess what we call the main event. Um, I think as I think as we all look at our elementary space, we all know that our elementary schools are packed. That we need to address our pre-K through five needs. The question is, what does it look like? And how do we provide that? Uh, I believe that if we take all of our pre-K out of our schools, uh, we're still at 85%. Yes, sir, just uh, about 85% or just under. Or just you know in that vicinity. So it, it is not long before, as in accordance with our MOU, that we would start to begin talking about space and how we provide additional space. And then I think the 90% the threshold comes to play for uh, construction when we, when we reach that point. Um, the pandemic has impacted enrollment and uh, particularly at the pre-K level, we can see how that is recovering. Um, I think some of the things which have also impacted our enrollment, which may not be uh, covered in the future think reports or other enrollment projections, um, six lanes between here and between Norfolk and Richmond, I think has an impact on us. Um, I think people moving out of the cities has an impact on us um, and looking for um, more, more of a, a yard and a, and a home and a, and a smaller community than, than was found in, in cities. So um, there's a lot of dynamics in play here and uh, we've already seen our elementary, elementary recover um, and I think, I think we're gonna see that build as we go forward. Um, the collective question we all have to answer is what, in the, what is in the best interest of our students, our staff, and our community? Um, will, will, a, will an elementary with a pre-K provide a better long-term solution for the, as a community um, if, we just, if we go into that construction? Um, building additions, uh, they can be done. It's not necessarily ideal for the building. I, don't, I think Mr. Mr. Hipple has mentioned that in the past. Um, to meet our needs, but it's it's certainly a, a viable option, in a, certainly in the short term. Um, uh, and I and I think I think also too that we have to recognize too that the, the school board has been relative has been very reasonable in our space requests. Um, when things change, we change. Uh, my high school, we've we've adapted our request for our high school, and so we don't we don't request things that we don't urgently need. Um, and so I, I think I think, and I think that's that needs to be that needs to be talked about here. Um, uh, it's it's also also you know I, I talked earlier about our community. If you if you look at our community, I think I've heard that we are the eighth fastest growing locality in the in the Commonwealth. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think James City County Williamsburg is a is a great place to live. I've lived here for a long time had the privilege of serving on the board for a long time. Not a long time, but for a while. Um, and I think, I think people are attracted to this. And I think, it, I think uh, the investments that we have made in our community from schools to parks to the whole, to you know, the way we have done development has made this attractive. And I think we need to continue to look, look towards that to continue to make sure that our, our community is an attractive place to live. So, um, and, and also, as part of this discussion, I think we should also keep in mind, we know we need elementary space. Um, the, uh, the CIP we have right now says pre-K through five. It does not say an elementary school. Um, it does not say pods. It says pre-K through five. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't really put a lot of um, effort, I don't believe, into doing the uh, estimating work that we need to, to understand what it would cost to put two wings on schools in two different locations. I think we've kind of done rule of thumb estimates and not solid estimates for what those need to be. Um, but at the end of the day, we need pre-K through five space. Um, I guess the law says that we can, if you guys fund us to, to do design work, we can design whatever we want to. We ain't gonna do that, we all know that. We're gonna we're gonna work together. And we're gonna we're not gonna go if you if we come to the conclusion today that we're not gonna build an elementary school that we're gonna build wings, 
Um, you fund our pre-K through five space, we're not gonna go out and design an elementary school, right? I mean, we're gonna design what, what we can fund um, and what we can get construction for. So I just think we, I think that level of trust needs to be in the room when we have this discussion. Um, because, because we're at a point now where we're breaking. We gotta do something. So um, we, we believe that in the, I, I think the majority of the school board believes that an elementary school with pre-K is in the best long-term interest of our community and our school system. Um, but we can talk about that, we can, we can discuss that. But uh, uh, I guess that's kind of where I'm gonna leave the discussion um, coming off of the uh, superintendent's proposed. This is not a school board uh, capital improvement yet plan yet. We vote on that on Tuesday. Um, but uh, that's kind of where I think the majority of, the, of our board is. So with that, I'll, anybody in the board, our school board have a, any comments to add to that? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I think I would uh, just, I, I support everything that you've said. And I think uh, as I've I listened to these conversations and the deliberations around preschool space, I think everybody in the room recognizes that uh, we, we are at that point where we've got to begin moving in a direction to serve our students and serve our community, serve our families. Um, for my part, uh, I'm ready to do something. And I think that if we can get funding to do something, and if that is uh, two wings and we see how that affects the future of our elementary schools and, and reduces uh, capacity at uh, Stonehouse and Norge and many other uh, elementary schools that are, are hurting right now capacity-wise, I think now is the time to do that. And so I appreciate uh, your, your words, Mr. Kelly, Mr. Chair, and uh, I, I appreciate uh, our funding partners and what you will, uh, the, the trust that you will endow us with uh, in, in our planning going forward. Thank you. Dr. Beers? Yeah, I echo Mr. Uh, Dow's comments. Um, um, I, I, think, uh, I think everybody in the board agrees that at some point we are going to need a new elementary school. I think the real question has been when are we going to need that new elementary school? Um, and um, having looked over um, the, 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 uh, the incredible amount of data that uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Heron's, Heron's um, staff have put together, um, I have come to the conclusion that um, it's better to get some space now than to continue to propose um, um, uh, the building of a new school when we uh, don't seem to have uh, overwhelming support for that at this time. I, I, would have to, I would have to think that city council school board, uh, uh, supervisors, county supervisors um, have to realize, and I think they do, I've, I've spoken to a number of you, that at some point we're going to need, we will need more space. We're not, we're not gonna stay stagnant. This is, a, this is an area that will continue to grow, but I think the, the um, um, and as one of my colleagues said, you know, I may not like this um, option too, but, um, but I think it's the best way to go at the moment where we are taking uh, the concerns of uh, the Board of Supervisors in as well as meet, trying to meet the needs of those uh, preschoolers. Um, and, and that's why I think we have to act, uh, act now. The one, ask, the one concern that I had, and I'm satisfied with the answer I got from the superintendent, is if you do have, if we do have these two centrally, I'm sorry, these two different uh, locations for our pre-K, uh, for our um, preschool um, uh, students, that uh, it's, it, it will be uh, uh, really important that we limit as best we can the amount of time those little kids stay on the bus to and from those locations and uh, in their home. I, I have to admit, I am not totally convinced <laughs> that uh, uh, two locations are enough, but I think for where we are right now, um, I, I, uh, I think option two is the most viable way to go at the moment 
notwithstanding the fact that uh, we do, we will need uh, a new elementary school uh, farther down the line. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Owen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think Ms. Hummel, if we were just going to go down the line. Okay. I'll defer. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Okay. And Ms. Hummel. <laughs> So um, I appreciate the Board of Supervisors and City Council's um, <laughs> desire to be efficient and to use our taxpayer dollars efficiently and wisely, and, and I think we uh, certainly are concerned about that and would like to focus on that as well. And I think from the ANLA report, it was clear to me that the most flexible space um, would be an elementary school with dedicated pre-K space, because if those numbers shift over the years, we could easily move children within a building, um, pre-K through two is, a, is can be very easily used in the same space. But if we have pods or other buildings that are detached or somewhere else designed for pre-K, if the numbers shift over time, that space cannot be easily used for K-5. So I think that the most efficient use and long-term solution to our space needs is an elementary school and in the time that we have discussed this and <clears throat> talked about it we all know building costs have, have gone through the roof and they'll continue to go through the roof so I, it looks like based on the data if we were to do a short-term decision and add pods or pre-k space we would then turn around and be having this conversation very quickly which also gets to and I think Ms. Hummel was going to speak to this uh, multiple redistricting so we would at the minute we build pre-k space we will redistrict the elementary level uh, we will pull kids you know we've got overcrowding at stone house with no pre-k so we would have to redistrict upwards of 150 students we have to move kids from matthew Ailey. and then right to, probably two years later would would be looking at possibly redistricting again for an elementary school so in a in a pre-k to fifth grade child's experience they could be looking at two redistrictings and Heretofore, this community has understood and been excited about redistricting when there's a new, sh new building to move into, but just to shift and redistrict and move children to help alleviate space needs and move them around has not been appealing <coughs> in this community. And I'm sorry, Ms. Hummel, maybe you can add on to that. Julie? Um, yes, thanks. I was going to kind of go down that road because I think as school board members and I'm sure Board of Supervisors and City Council have always also experienced this. The, the things that, that make our citizens upset um, and it, it's anything that happens to their child. So I, I do know that if uh, we're going to have to do not, not like a big chunk of students being redistricted to a new elementary school, but we're going to have to be doing a lot of what I would consider spot redistricting, like move a little, you know, like, I don't know, 50 kids here, 100 kids here, all over the school district. And I just wanna make sure that the community is like prepared, prepared for that eventuality, prepared for, for uh, you know, not for kids not having to move to another school, not knowing anyone outside of their neighborhood, perhaps that are going there. And, that's, if that's the reality, we just need to really prep our students for that uh, in our families for that reality and, and, you know, make sure that everyone's well aware that that's what's gonna be happening. Um, and then once again, just having the flexibility that uh, another elementary school would give us versus being hamstrung with pre-K pre, um, space within two schools but you know I'm not I don't I don't control the purse strings so, um, I I know that's that's the Board of Supervisors and City Council's position I just wanted to throw that out as it, it will be a concern for our citizens Mr. Pons Mr. Hill not a uh, any comment but a quick question um, you had mentioned that if we did build um, some elementary space or pre-k space that elementary capacity would go down to 85 to 86 percent. Is that without trailers? Yes, sir. If we were to take all, almost 400 uh, pre-K students out of our elementary schools now, they would be about 85 percent or just beneath that, probably slightly above it next year potentially. So yes. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up on that? Because uh, it was a comment about 
um, that we would then need to in very quickly um, look at elementary school. If if we got down to 85 percent, what what are your projections telling you? At what point would we need? How many years out are we looking that we would be up? That we would need to start looking at another space. I think it really depends. If we look at the projections at, a, at the lowest level, which of course we keep it at high, over high this year, right. and I think that's a comeback from the pandemic that potentially will start to level out. At the lowest level, we potentially got to add 285 students over 10 years. At the highest level, it could be 660, which is the equivalent of a school. So it really depends how quick, how fast that growth happens as to how quickly we would then need an elementary school. I would be very surprised if we don't need it within six or seven years. So potentially, Mrs. Hummel mentioned redistricting, we could be redistricting to push because of two pre-K spaces, and then we could be redistricting again within 10, within 10 years for an elementary school. That's the worst possible scenario, because families would be redistricting, redistricting twice within their elementary career. So you're saying we would, if we built now, alleviated some space, most likely what you're, as superintendent of schools, you're saying that in seven years, we could possibly be looking at building an elementary school? Potentially, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, I've got a, a few things. Um, and, and our board, and I know the city council as well, always supported the school system. Y'all you know, do a great job in the school system, and, and don't want anybody to think that, that you're not. I think we have first-class schools totally in, in James City County, and, and y'all have done an excellent job. On the other side, ours is to watch the funding as tight as possible, as everyone knows. And I think bright beginnings, not necessarily pre-K, but bright beginnings is, is where we're looking at and, and how we can help the school system. And I know it's been four or five years and John led the charge in one of these meetings back then speaking about, I see this issue and this is, issue is coming up and we need to start addressing it. And so I've, I've sat in these meetings for four or five years and we are still addressing the same thing. And I'm glad we're to the point now where evidently we're all wanting to figure out what we need to do with this issue, which would be the bright beginnings and, and relieving the elementary schools from the pressure that they're getting. If we build, I don't call them pods, uh, you can call them pods or, or creative learning cottages or- Wings. What a space or Wings. whatever. Um, was adding on to the buildings and utilizing our existing staff as much as possible. I know we can't, you know, there's a, there's a different teacher for bright beginnings than there is for elementary school, but that would give us a six to 10 years. Will we need a new elementary school? Eventually we will, eventually we might need a middle school, eventually we may need a high school as we grow and, and things change. But over the next 10 years, it's fairly flat and as Dr. Herring and I were talking earlier, you know, this would relieve probably six to 10 years before we'd have to look at that elementary school. Redistricting, of course, is all in y'all's wick house. And, and I, I, I know it's- You don't care about that. It's a tough thing to do. <laughs> and thank goodness that y'all have that responsibility and not us. Um, and I know it's very hard because parents get set in a way and, and they don't want to change but we change every day in things that we do. And that comes with figuring out, okay, are we gonna tax more so that we have parents that don't wanna change? Or are we gonna do it across the board and say, let's keep the tax where it needs to be and look at the fact that, you know, we may have to redistrict. We're gonna to have to redistrict this next voting cycle and we're gonna to have to do some redistricting. And our board has already discussed that and, who we move and and some of these some of our um, um, people that we represent are not going to vote for six years so that's a concern so how do we break that down same with redistricting for 
you know, your um, your buildings and how your growth is coming and that's why. But um, I think that what John started four or five years ago with looking at bright beginnings and looking at how do we relieve, alleviate the school issues with the elementary schools, I've got to say he was right on it. And, um, and he was able to see it and start talking about it those many years ago. I think we're at a point now, I know this, our board will very much support the schools and, and adding on in order to do the, what we need to for bright beginnings and, and get those students out of elementary school, relieve your elementary school classrooms. And if I'm, if I'm correct, I think bright beginnings is 10 or 14 students where um, elementary school is 20 to 23 students. So you need more space for bright beginnings than you would for elementary. So that pulling that out of there may give you a little bit more cushion in your elementary school as, as far as everything I've been reading. Um, I know some of the other board members have other questions, but I just want to start with that and, and let you know that, that our board definitely supports the school. But we also have to remember we've got a you know amount of money we can spend on everything as you all know you all have the same thing with your budget and so we just want to try to figure out a a good middle ground for the bright beginnings yes sir. two more questions if i could um what are the, the 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 whole numbers if we build a new elementary school with pre-k space versus building two wings is there have we done that analysis um and then a secondary question would be <clears throat> I recall when we were having the uh, school conversation and whether we were to add a wing to um, Berkeley or any of the others, but the challenge was the cafeteria wouldn't fit. The hallways were too small. There were not, not enough bathrooms. Would we have that same challenge if we added wings to ele current elementary school? What does that mean for the rest of the space in those schools? Would, would we be finding ourselves in a challenge? Yeah, if we were to <clears throat> add to uh, annexes in the same, you know, coexisting with elementary schools for bright beginnings pre-K, um, generally the, the pre-K students do not utilize the gym. They use the cafeteria function to some extent, but they don't usually come into the cafeteria because it's a four-hour program. So they could coexist without impacting this, the, the central spaces of an elementary school. Um, I think in, in a separate annex to the, the main building, it would have a new air conditioning and things like that, so it wouldn't be drawing upon the, the original school, nor just one of the sites we're considering. You don't wanna just add classrooms onto the end of a building in a 50-year-old school, so we're thinking more of a coexisting space where some of the staffing could be shared, but mostly uh, Bright Beginnings, but obviously it needs its own teachers, it needs its own teacher assistants, it has its own support staff uh, to support special education students. Um, so yes, it, it, it wouldn't really impact the buildings if a separate structure. I'd, I'd also like to just take off from Michael, what you said earlier, don't don't think the school board doesn't appreciate the funding and, and the support that we've gotten from the Board of Supervisors and and the City Council. Um, uh, this, I think I appreciate the opportunity for me to say probably for the last time that our funding problems don't originate on Mount Bay or Lafayette Street. They're in Richmond. So yes. um, <laughs> uh, so I appreciate I appreciate that opportunity to say that one more time. Um, and uh, and we certainly appreciate all the support that we've gotten from the Board of Supervisors and City Council to to continue operating our schools, um, but the problems in Richmond. Yes, so. I agree. Mr. Lisa? Mr. Chair, if I could just add on to Mr. Pons's comments and, and back to uh, my point of flexibility. Um, to your point, Mr. Pons, if we, if we add additional space, whether it's attaching it to a building or a, a pod out in the parking lot, that is not as flexible, right? That, that would be designated pre-K space so if, if, again, we woke up one day and those pre-K babies were all gone and we only had K through fifth grade students, we could not use that space to meet elementary needs, uh, especially with sticking out in the parking lot somewhere. That, that's not how we structure our elementary schools. If anyone's, you've toured our buildings, you know, we have like 
the first grade section and the second grade section and teachers collaborate together they work in groups based on grade level so while that will meet the needs of our pre-k students it does not going forward meet the needs of k through fifth grade and if we were to attach it to the building and we did try to use that space later on at some point for elementary it would tax it would tax the building because you're right those buildings were designed for 400 students let's say and the cafeteria is designed for that size and the gymnasium and the library and all the centers and the hallways so if we added wings on to existing elementary buildings and at some point tried to use that for elementary space we would find ourselves in a in a pickle that, that it's not as flexible as designing an elementary school with dedicated pre-k space which then could be flexibly used based on the students that we have at any given point in time. Thank you. Appreciate that. So I guess that begs the question. Uh, oh. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I know there's a delay. I apologize. I, can I get a couple questions answered, please? How many? So how many currently do we have in the Bright Beginnings program? I'm going to ask Mr. Walker to address that question in particular because we have a certain number right now and we also have a waiting list in the current program, but I do believe we fill every space every year. Good morning. Currently okay, we Okay, so well, we, if we have a, I'm sorry, if we have a waiting list and, and then I was listening to some of the presentation that we had previously that there's anywhere, I've heard conflicting numbers that there's anywhere from 50 to 250 possible bright beginning students that we're looking to serve in the future. Is that correct? According to the ANLA report, <clears throat> they've identified uh, mm -hmm. 231 students that are eligible for bright beginning services that are not currently being served. Mr. Walker will just give us some of our current numbers in our current program. Good morning. Currently, we have 325 students being served in our Bright Beginnings program. Um, we have just under 100 students, 100 seats that we're looking at potentially filling. Um, <clears throat> roughly 40 of those seats are for students that potentially could be receiving special education services. And then we have our waiting list of students waiting for a spot. Uh, roughly at about 50. All right, thank you. That so that helps me a lot. So based on that, I'm I'm not seeing the need going away for this space. It seems to me like it's um, it potentially could be increasing. So I think to me, I, I I think we can all agree that space in the schools is something that we need. For me, it's because of what group do we need this space right now i'm looking at space that's needed for the bright beginnings program and in addressing the need for the bright beginnings program that opens up space for our elementary students so that that's kind of the spot i'm in right now is trying to figure out what our immediate needs are um, and, and I'm just wondering if Mr. Mr. Stevens, I know you've been um, deeply involved in the, the large amount of data that we've received. And I'm just wondering if, if you wouldn't mind sharing your thoughts on kind of where we are based on the research and studying that you've done on all of this. If you could just help us um, guide us through this a little bit from your perspective, if you would. Well, sure. Uh, good morning, uh, all. I, I will say you know, we've had a lot of conversation uh, with the superintendent and our staff and looking through, and, and I, I think we all agree, as our chairman has said, that the, the need for space within the element, elementary schools is, is paramount. And I think we've all agreed that at 85 percent we talk about it, at 95, at 90 percent we would have a plan. And I think at least some of that has been the plan may be to hold the course, and some of the plan has been we would build something. Um, I think, at least for me, when we talk, look at the, the future think, um, it is really hard to know what 10 years is going to be. That's a lot that can happen between here and now. Uh, do I think the need for an elementary school will be there someday? I do. Do I think it's in the six year time frame? I hope not, but it's hard to tell based on the numbers that are out there today. Um, what the superintendent has shared is certainly possible, uh, but I think the pre-K space uh, provides that stopgap. It should be at a lesser cost. Um, I know we have some numbers today that uh, 
are still pretty significant, whether it's pre-K or a new elementary school. Uh, my hope is as they get into the design of that, if the uh, boards were moving forward towards pre-K, that when we refine the design, the cost per square foot would be something less for the pre-K and not what appears to be a similar cost for an elementary school and a pre-K. And again, maybe some debate on what size that should be. So I think for me, moving forward with pre-K makes a lot of sense. Um, it solves the initial need. It at least takes you through that five plus year time frame and maybe beyond that. Um, and we look to a different solution uh, in the next 10 plus year time frame. Just a, a clarifying question. So what I'm hearing is if we build the wings, we still may need to build an elementary school in, in seven years, but we don't know what that may look like to Mr. Stevens' points. But if we built the new elementary school with pre-K space today, would we have to build anything in seven years for, for pre-K? If we build, um, as Adler suggested in the report, an elementary school with a preschool wing attached to serve to about 250 students, obviously that's a longer term solution. Uh, can I get Ms. Cook in on, in this conversation? Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Yeah, um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. I um, I do support the um, the addition of an elementary school inclusive of pre-K space, um, and I, I, I'm a little concerned about the pressure that wings will put on cafeterias because even though those students don't go in to the cafeterias, the cafeteria does have to support those kids, and I'm not sure that they're set up to do that. Um, ad additionally, it's staff's recommendation to build, a, and has been for many years, to build an elementary school. And I, um, you know, I tend to um, to support uh, sort of what the educational experts are telling us. Uh, that said, I, I appreciate the board of supervisors' position that pre-K needs to be pulled out of um, elementary schools. Uh, reasonable people disagree on which is the best place way to approach that. Uh, certainly there are standalone facilities at other places in the state, so it's not unheard of. Um, I, but I do, you know, we're talking about wings plural, and so since we're talking about pivoting away from what, you know, the, the, the WJCC staff and school board have asked for for the last several years to, um, uh, you know, pulling all the pre-K out and establishing two wings at two elementary schools, I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page for doing that at the same time. Because if we did one wing and then another wing, um, that would really cause sort of chaos. And then if, if growth happened and we needed an elementary school, we could be redistricting uh, multiple times in 10 years, let's say. And so I, um, I want to just ask that question flatly, is if the wing approach is the direction that these three bodies decide to go, are, is everybody on board for building both wings at the same time so we're only doing that redistricting once? And, and before I stop, I just want to also say, you know, one of the things that I really lament about this process is I know all of us have talked to varying constituencies about what we want to do as a community moving forward. And I think we've heard from people who, who disagree with the need for a new elementary school, but I'm not sure we've done Yeoman's work when it comes to actually asking the community, you know, I harken back to the, you know, the referendum, if you will, to build the Warhill um, uh, facilities. I, um, you know, I don't, I don't know that this community doesn't want to build a new elementary school, and I don't think that we've asked. And I think, you know, the school board has in the past um, sort of activated its networks to ask uh, its key stakeholders and constituents to, to share their voice and that isn't always you know, appreciated, but I'm not sure that we know what parents want. And, and so it, I, I kind of lament making the decision to not go with an elementary school when we're not sure that that's what the community wants in the future. So that's all I have to say, but I do wanna ask that question about both wings at the same time to make sure that I understand what's being suggested. Thank you. Great, I'm gonna go to Jim and John and then come back to Dr. Beers. John. You, 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 you will, yeah, you if you wouldn't mind, um, I, I do have to uh, to leave uh, shortly uh, uh, for my day job. Uh, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> uh, but I, I did want to just uh, add a couple of points. Um, first of all, I, I want to uh, express my appreciation to everybody for um, being willing to look at uh, some of these issues and, and to recognize that there are valid uh, um, points of uh, agreement and disagreement. And I think one of the points of disagreement is just exactly how we deal with some of our space needs. 
But the point of agreement is that we may be at a, a wonderful inflection point to be able to meet needs of children who are currently not being served. We know we have a need for pre-K that uh, has not been met for many years as a result of uh, looking at waiting lists for those services and children that we know are uh, eligible to receive services if uh, they are available. And so with the report that ANLAR did uh, demonstrating that there are about 230 or so students who currently would qualify uh, for uh, or, or would have demonstrated need for pre-K, uh, I think that uh, this is a, a great opportunity for us to move forward on that particular concern. We're also at a, at a moment when it appears that there is significant momentum at the state and national level for addressing pre-K needs, which may mean that we will have some additional financial support in that regard, and that would be wonderful if it happens. But whether it happens or not, we know that our own uh, community needs to have uh, some additional resources in that regard. Um, I do strongly support the idea that we um, move forward on providing um, separate facilities for pre-K. And I don't, don't like uh, to have a discussion that simply says we're going to put wings on buildings. That may or may not be the best way to do it, but it's not the only option, and the superintendent has already suggested that uh, thinking about Norge, it probably would be a standalone building adjacent to the existing elementary school, but one that could be designed to meet needs such as cafeterias and so forth. As Ms. Sadler suggested a moment ago, uh, if we know that, that uh, we are going to have some additional growth at the elementary school level, it's hard to imagine that wouldn't happen without some children coming along who would be in pre-K. Uh, so the need for pre-K is certainly something that we would anticipate. The numbers that have been provided here this morning, which show updated costs, suggest that we could uh, provide for a couple of facilities uh, not necessarily wings, maybe there would be wings, uh, not necessarily standalone, but maybe that would be the best to do it. Maybe there would be one place where we did a wing and another place with standalone. All those I think are important questions for us to consider. But just looking at the raw numbers presented this morning, uh, l using the low number, we see that an elementary school would cost us $39 million and that a pre-K building would cost us uh, two pre-K buildings would cost us $25 million. That's a significant amount of money that we can put to use in other ways that will help to strengthen both the pre-K program and the elementary program, Be, uh, providing additional space at schools and uh, allowing us to deal with the, uh, the current situation where as a result of a combination of trying to address uh, uh, the ability of, of students to have a better student-teacher ratio in classes, uh, have more support services that are uh, um, uh, needed to a greater extent, and uh, just to, to have the opportunity to, to have a stable uh, elementary school uh, uh, situation within a building, uh, all uh, could be met with uh, the movement toward uh, the design of buildings that are constructed with the idea of serving pre-K needs, especially in a district which is noted for providing uh, pre-K needs in particular to students who have uh, disabilities of one kind or another that require special attention. So I appreciate uh, all of the discussion. I think that, that uh, uh, the ma main point here today is simply to say, uh, at least from my perspective, that uh, there is a clear choice to be made that is uh, an efficient and wise uh, means of meeting uh, the needs of both elementary and pre-K students, uh, that uh, by taking that step, we will both be addressing a shortfall in our current offerings to, to children in need, and that uh, as we uh, do that, we also create uh, a, an, an abundance of additional space that is currently not being utilized for the purposes it was constructed, which was to serve children in the K-5 uh, age categories. So again, I appreciate all the uh, discussion. Uh, I think you know where I stand on, on this issue, and I uh, thank you all for the, for the chance to be with you today, as I will slip out shortly. <laughs> and before I do, just also take a second to 
to uh, recognize that some of uh, our, our members are not going to be at future uh, meetings of this kind, much to their regret, I'm sure, uh, but just to express my uh, uh, gratitude for your service and for uh, the very reasonable and uh, rational discussions we've been able to have over the years. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Eisenhower? Jim? Okay. Um, I, I think we all can agree that the need for pre-K space is not the pre-K through five, if you will, the whole the whole thing. Uh, the need for space is not in dispute. I guess the, the what we're looking for is how to best provide that space. And I'll tell you that for me, accurate and detailed data is is needed if we're going to make uh, an effective decision. Um, currently, as the superintendent said, we're the Kent, the elementary school K through five is at 85% of capacity. And I'm gonna come back down to some of the data and I wanna go back to the, the, the Future Think report because when we did our agreement back in 2018, that said we're gonna use the triggers of 85 and 90% and that we would use the low projection, which was fine. Uh, I understand that we've had a blip with this uh, uh, pandemic and that you are having to uh, figure out how you're gonna handle coming back up to where we were or going forward. But I think that there's a couple of things that, that concern me about the, the Future Think report and the, the validity of the data that we would be looking at. If you remember when we had that discussion three or four years ago, I actually sat down and did a really detailed analysis of what a projection was and then how it actually materialized 10 years later, not one year or two years. What we found was that all the projections from high to low were fairly tight for the first couple of years, and then they diverged quite widely in the last four, five, six years. Out at the 10-year point was what we were looking at. And we, the reason we settled on the low projection was because historically, that was where the projection from 10 years earlier wound up. And we did it on a rolling basis. Every year, we'd update the, I'd update the thing and take a look at it. Um, so I, I look at this and I say, I understand that the, the pandemic has caused a blip in, your, in, in how you're addressing it, and, and I can accept that. But I think looking long term, we really have to continue to look at the uh, low projection for where we're going to be 10 years from now until such time as data shows that that has significantly changed. You notice it hasn't changed some of the other places, like high school. It's, everything's fairly flat for the 10-year pro uh, program. Um, if you use that low projection data and you go out 10 years, our elementary schools, if you just have K through 5, in 10 years, get up to about 89%. So I would think somewhere about nine or 10 years out, we're going to have a discussion and take action. We're gonna start having a discussion before then, but we're gonna take action somewhere nine to 10 years out of building another elementary school. At that time, we'll have to take a look and say, how big a school do we do? And you know, you build a school and, and how long is it gonna to take to fill it up? Well, you know, it'll give you a lot, of, a lot of absorption space. So that's what we have to, have to look at in the long term. Um, I think the real impact right now is that the pre-K uh, and what it, what it does and, and the option to pull it out and look at it uh, independently uh, really really is, a, I think, a step forward. A um, couple of things about the future think that I also uh, wanted to talk about was uh, the, the 2.88 per household, whereas uh, that's not what our, our localities are reporting, 2.424 for Williamsburg and 2.55 for James City County. And the fact that we still have a growth of 2% in age-restricted communities where we don't have any kids, but they're projecting growth of kids. You know, when, when you see things like this, it basically makes me question the underlying assumptions and validity of what we're looking at for these long-term projections. So I, I'm, I'm, uh, I would like to see it see a really tightened up, uh, a little better explanation of, of how we get to where we're going long term with the future think, uh, data. The other data I, I, I would uh, you know, tell you is that we've got, we're dealing with fairly uh, broad rule of thumb data right now. Uh, when we start to the, to the point where we are right now, we need to make a decision. We're gonna need more accurate data to make, make an effective decision. Um, and I will, I will uh, tell you that there's an old adage I used to use, uh, you know, measure it with a micrometer, mark it with a piece of chalk, and cut it with an ax. Um, that's 
that's a, about where we are with, with some of this data. We've got to be able to get that back to where we are more confident in, in the uh, reliability and accuracy of the data that we're going to be using for making, making a decision. That being said, let me go ahead and just take a look at uh, um, what we are, what, what's being proposed. I had, I had some questions, you know, about uh, the, the figures that were used, but that's okay. I'll just use the figures that were in your little report you gave us to us yesterday. And by the way, I really appreciated that. That really, that really helped me focus. Essentially, it's going to cost about $40 million, according to this estimate, for a new school. Um, and that was one that would include the, the pre-K wing. It was 850 students total. Um, we figure, you figure that you've got to buy land for it, and then you're going to have to have an overhead cost for a new school, and that combined two would probably be at least $5 million. If you do the two pre-K facilities that you're talking about, it's about $25 million. So the difference is, and, and, and there you wouldn't have land acquisition costs and you wouldn't have the overhead of a new, new, a new school. So the difference is about $20 million. <clears throat> so you can solve your, your problem one way or another with a difference in price tag of $20 million. And my question is, what do you get for that $20 million? If you get flexibility, is that really enough? Um, what I would say is I would like to see you look at the, at the uh, option two. Uh, a couple questions I would pose. Are two facilities enough? I think what you're going to see is that in the future, you're going to have growth, significant growth, in the pre-K programs. I think you're looking at some federal money coming down, uh, some state money. Uh, they may be looking at a, a, a universal pre-K program. Those are things we've got to keep in mind. So are two locations enough? That's something I, I think we ought to look at. Um, I know that the third rail for both of our organizations, all of our organizations, for the school board, it's redistricting. For the uh, jurisdictions, it's tax rates. And no matter what you do, you're going to be making a tough decision, and somebody's going to be mad at you at the end of the decision. So you have a, a really difficult one. We try to minimize those decisions. I think we need to minimize the number of times you, you make um, uh, uh, redistricting, especially spot redistricting. I can understand the sensitivity, sensitivity of that. But if you do this, these, these two facilities and you have an opportunity to redistrict, I think it, you take that opportunity. There is going to be a requirement to redistrict again when you build another school, but that may be eight, ten years down the line. And I think that's something that uh, uh, we, we need to all consider. Um, I think the growth rate in pre-K will be more than it is in the, in the regular uh, kindergarten uh, because we're attracting folks that are just not being served right now, whereas that's not the case in, in the others. So I would like to see you proceed with the option two. I would like to see us um, really crunch the numbers because um, I'd, like, I'd like to see, you know, my daughter's a math teacher and she does this whole thing, of, you know, I want to see the work because I look at this and I say, all right, we had so many thousand square feet at, at so many dollars per square foot and the numbers didn't come out with the numbers we had there. So, you know, somewhere in there, there were some assumptions that I missed. So we, we need to see a little more detail on that. I think this is the point going forward where our administrations need to get together and really crunch those numbers and come back and give us a, a really good feel as we go into our budget session this year uh, of what it is, because I think we need to make a decision now. I think we need to get it in the budget now, and I think we need to build it as quickly as we can. Thank you. I haven't had anybody yell at me in the last two years, Jim. I'm not really sure what you're talking about. <laughs> Dr. Beers? Yeah, just a couple of points. Um, first of all, I'd like to point out um, um, that if you look at our current enrollments in uh, Bright Beginnings and our waiting list, we're, look, we're looking at just around 400 students. That's half of an elementary school. Those kids, at some point, are going to be part of our elementary school population. So I uh, very much agree um, with what Jim uh, was talking about, is that so d down the line, these kids, you know, they're going to be in our school systems. And, and, and the other point that I also agree with um, is that the preschool population is the fastest growing population um, in our in our school system, um, it's a little skewed within the, within the uh, Viper Kinnings program to begin with because over seventy percent 
of the students that are in that program um, have IDA disability. The list of those who are waiting um, are not the special ed kids. They're the other at-risk kids. And, they're gonna, and we're going to see, uh, uh, we're going to obviously see the special ed population continue to grow because we have such um, superb uh, accommodations and programs for those um, children. But the other population that is also growing um, are, is, is that population, uh, many who are working in the service industry, um, it is going to be um, uh, those children that we're going to see also uh, an increase. And, it's, and, and Jim, it is hard. It's hard to project, even over the next five years, what that growth is going to be. What I've always felt, um, actually um, amazed, but I've always felt good about, our ability to project our school population over the last 10, 15 years has been phenomenal. We, sure, we're not totally right on, but we are so close. We have been so close. So um, I, uh, um, I, I want us to keep that uh, in, uh, in, in mind, but uh, what is in preschool is going to be in our elementary school at some point. That's all. Ms. Cook? You know, I see the no, but it is, that is true. Yeah, it is true. Ms. Cook? <laughs> and thank you, Mr. Kelly. Um, I just wanted to respond to Ms. Gressenhauer's comments about um, future thinking. And I, um, I do recall your analysis of their um, projections over time and really did appreciate that. And I've, I've held on to those uh, documents that you shared uh, and refer to them every now and then. And you're absolutely right, over, um, as, as we get further and further out, the, the projections become less and less accurate. But um, I think because they use the cohort survival method, um, that is why when we had a sort of artificial and sudden, uh, artificially low and sudden, sudden drop in enrollment, uh, that uh, because of the pandemic, that's why we had to just very temporarily pivot away from the low projections because of the cohort survival method. It, it, it's an art. It's starting from an artificially low point. Just I just wanted to clarify that. And then uh, as far as the age restricted neighborhood and the growth there, you know, at, uh, um, at the school board meeting when they presented, we asked uh, that question. And um, at the end of the day, uh, they, they do those projections at the census block and census tract levels. So it's really um, not, it's not appropriate to, um, to look at that from a neighborhood level at that granular level when it's really at a sort of a higher sort of census tract, census block level, those growth projections. And lastly, they, the, they explained the, why they use family size versus household size and the difference between that. So I just wanted to let you know that we were asked those questions. We did ask them of ANLAR and they did um, answer them, I think, to, uh, satisfactorily. And so I think from that perspective, um, there, when, when we do start to recover, our enrollment numbers do start to recover from the pandemic, I think we'll, we'll be able to trust those numbers as much as Dr. Beers just indicated we've been able to trust them in the past. So I just did want to address those comments. And, um, and, you know, we're always happy to answer, ask them more questions if you have any. Go ahead. Well, so, um, well, first let me, let me say that, you know, I certainly do appreciate the, the partnership that we all have here and, and, um, and want to state that I understand and recognize that James City County pays 90% of whatever's to come forward, but it, I would submit that it's certainly relative to our population and budgets. Um, my concern is if we if we try to save the delta between building two wings and building an elementary school with uh, space um, is a short-term solution that will ultimately cost us more. Um, you know, yes, we spent twenty-six million dollars, whatever that number is, twenty-five million dollars today to build the wings. Um, but we're going to have to come back and build more elementary space pretty soon, and so. We're going to add another 40 million or 50 million, whatever that number is, in six years, and so then that number gets even bigger. Um, but then I think we're also going to be faced with future needs in middle uh, uh, middle schools and high schools moving forward. And so, 
if we are faced with having to build a an elementary school in seven years, I think there's need for more space in the other schools in, in 10 years. So we're going to be pushing big, big, big ticket items further out and we'll have the same conversation. Um, a lot of what I hear today is the same conversation we had when we decided, made a decision on James Blair. You know, I think we pushed that back and ultimately um, making that decision that we did ending up with James Blair, it's great for the students there, but we know that there's going to be need to convert the office space to future element, uh, middle school space. And so that school is going to cost over $60 million in total when you think about it. By not making the right decision then, um, we're faced with a, a bigger bill. And I think if we make the wrong decision today, we're ultimately going to pay more. And it's going to cost our, our residents and taxpayers a whole lot more than we need to by, by pushing this further down the road. So personally, I think option one is the best option. Yeah, when you make when you pull the trigger on that uh, middle school option, you have to pull the trigger on an administration building as well. So right. that's got to put the administration somewhere. I, I would like to, if you don't mind, I'd like to just sort of respond to that a little bit. Um, I understand. I understand the concern you have. Uh, but look at the other side of it. You know, we're relatively flat over a 10-year period. You go build a big building. If we had built all of James Blair, we would now be sitting with a tremendously underutilized system. We would have uh, excess space that, would, that really wouldn't be, be utilized. And is that really efficient to have, you know, maybe a, a school at 70% capacity um, of, over a, a, eight, a six or eight or 10 year period? Uh, you know, those are, those are uh, I think, there are two sides to that, to that option. Um, yeah, everything's going to cost more when you build it uh, down, down, the, down the line. Um, but the, the question I don't want to get back into is where we, we had to build, we built, in my term on the board, we built, I think, four schools in like about two years. Uh, and that just really strained us tremendously. Right, and that's uh, my point about the future. If we yeah, push off well, I, I understand. But, uh, you know, the, and the difficulty right now is that there's a balance on how you do it. You know, you don't want to build it before you really truly need it and build it and just have it sit there. And, you know, if you say, all right, we're going to have tremendous growth in the future and we're going to build it and it's going to sit maybe empty, predominantly empty for a year or two, but it'll fill up with kids as we go, like it was back in, you know, 2000 to 2010 or so. Uh, that's one case, but if you but if your projections are to be relatively flat and you build it and it's empty and it sits empty for ten years, that's not really a cost-effective use of the resources. So you know, I I, I understand that there's a balance in it. Um, I, I, that's why I'm I'm comfortable with option two because I can see that in my mind, the need for additional space, for maybe even both of them, probably doesn't occur until you get out about eight or ten years. And it'll be somebody else's problem because it won't be me. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kelly. Yeah, and um, you go to Michael first. Don't come back the, to me, please. The, um, Ms. Sadler's waiting, and, yeah. I, and I'd like to speak as well. Okay, but got you. Go ahead. The, um, you know, option two, it's, it's not saying we'll, we're saying, okay, add on or have a pod or whatever. That would be y'all's wheelhouse as far as what works and get with architects and that's why to figure out what works to fill this need and um you know i don't want anybody to think leaving this table today that that okay you can only build a pod and there's been even conversation we'll build a pod in a parking lot well that sounds terrible who would do that um that wouldn't work to begin with and but to add on to a school or whatever works for your facilities you know, it may be a standalone building. It may be a connection, and um, but it, it's it's something that I feel that you know our board's looking at. You know, not building the elementary school, especially when we won't need it for six to ten years. There's no need letting. I mean, we saw it in, in one of our schools, um, um, Laurel, where we had the um, problem with. Um, the air quality and that sort of thing when the pandemic hit. And that was just a pandemic. We leave a building sitting idle or half used for seven, eight years, you know, I, my citizens are going to ask me, what were you thinking? Really? And, and I'm going to have to answer those questions. Um, and that space just sitting idle like that does not help that building's health at all. Um, and it, it is tough to figure out 
when do we build and when do we own. We know we're probably going to have to build an elementary school in, in eight or ten years. But as of right now, we need to figure out the issues that y'all have at hand. And we want to work with y'all on this board. We want to work with your board to figure out, okay, what can we spend and how can it fit your needs and your design of what will fit Y'all know schools, y'all know children. You know, we're not saying this is what you have to do because y'all can basically by law do what you want to do. We're saying let's work together and let's take this need that we have. We've all determined what it is and where it is and, and we've all got different opinions of how to solve it. But funding it would be the two of us responsibility, of course. James City County would be a tad bit more than Williamsburg, but uh, <laughs> all relative, <laughs> all relative, all relative, and um, but and and it and it works good. The um, but we're not telling you have to do one one type item. You know, have to do this or that or the other. We're saying let's partner together. Let's look at option two. Let's figure out how we can build this facility. For the bright beginnings and what we have and, and what we have looking at future coming up to fill those spaces and then we'll look at the elementary school which will be as, as i think almost all of us agree is we're looking eight to ten years out well you know there's a lot of savings in that process as we put it in our cip and all to, to figure out how to fund that as we go along um i know miss sadler had a few questions Jay. yeah i was i was gonna go ruth sue oh, and lisa okay. that, that works Sue Ms. First. Sadler first. Can she... Ms. Sadler? Hey, can you, am I in? Yeah, we hear I you. I never know with this. We hear you. <laughs> you can hear me, okay. Just, thank you, just to, <clears throat> pardon me, just a couple things. I, I um, in, am in favor of option two as well. And I, I think primarily because we need to address the immediate need and the immediate need is looking at the bright beginnings, children, their needs, and then that in turn will again, free up that elementary space. To Mr. Eisenhower's point, um, the amount of data that we've received, it's hard to land on something. So I, I think um, in looking at the um, numbers that are flat over the next 10 years, that lends me more to the option two, um, uh, to option two as a, a solution. But in terms of looking at um, that neighborhood granular level data with the age restricted communities. Um, I think that's something that we have to pay very close attention to because it does alter those numbers. And we do have several age restricted communities. I want to make sure in getting the proper data that we as our localities can apply to what our needs are we have to have those accurate numbers. So I think we have to make sure, and I think that's been an issue in the past, if, not, if I'm not mistaken, as to, how, as to pulling those, um, those neighborhoods out. So they may look at census blocks, and I, I get that, but we have to look at our neighborhoods. So we have to make sure that we do have the right data to make the accurate um, th the right decision for our community. So I, I am, um, I'm in favor of option two to address those immediate needs. And I think I had about 20 other questions, but um, if we're, I'll jump in again if they come back to me. So thanks, that's all I have for now. I, I just wanted to make sure that you know, Ms. Ramsey or your vice mayor didn't have it, because I've spoken once already or before I jump in. <clears throat> oh, okay. Go ahead, Barbara. Oh, so I just had one question. When we're talking about immediate need and option two to address that, what does immediate construction mean? I mean, if we're saying that, you know, the interest is to go to option two for to do something right now, does that mean that those wings or pods would be constructed and ready for use next school year? Would it be FY20? Three twenty-four. It, it takes a, a considerable time to design and then begin construction. And Mr. Snipes can probably give us a very quick analysis of the normal timeline for a school. And really, this, the two annexes are the equivalent of a school. They're just little baby schools, basically. Two half schools. For design. 
Um, and for a school, it's typically 18 to 24 months. I would presume something that's a little smaller would probably be about 18 months. So you're looking at about two and a half years. So you're looking at two and a half years, and then if you're saying that you would need a new elementary school, say in eight years, you would need to start that process in about five, five or six years Correct. to have it completed at the time when it might be needed. Correct. So there would be only like three or four years in between where you would need to, you'd have the, the pre-K built, but then in about three years you would need to start the design work on a new elementary school to have it completed construction in about eight years. If you want, yep, if you wanted about 2028, 20, yes. Okay. So immediate, and, and during that time period, as Dr. Beer said, those pre-K kids are going to be progressing into elementary school. Not having head kids, but I think that's the way it normally works. <laughs> that's usually how it works, right? <laughs> Thank you, just wanted to clarify that. Thanks. Yeah, so Barbara brings up a good point, and, and that's, I've been sitting here, and even last night, trying to weigh all this information, and obviously we have reports from educators that are making recommendations, um, but we talk about addressing an immediate need. It, in that time period, it doesn't appear that we're addressing an immediate need um, if we're building two smaller structures, whatever they end up being. Um, and when you look at the figures, I, I too, I, and again, the mayor, mayor pointed out, and uh, Mr. Hipple, you know, they they pay a larger portion, but it's all relative. Um, but it's it seems to me over the long term that we're that. The money to fix this um, this immediate need um, is not cost effective for the long term. When you look at the price, the cost of a new elementary school, and we're already encroaching on that as we move forward with these smaller facilities. Thank you. Uh, I, if I could go back to, um, I, I think it was Mr. Walker. He said 325 students and then 100 seats. I, I, I did not under, get what that meant all the way. Sorry. So we currently have 395 seats for the Bright Beginnings program. Okay. And right now, 325 of those 395 are filled. Okay. And roughly 100 students on a wait list to get in which would go above and beyond the 395. Okay, and, and the reason they're on the wait list? They're about, we're projecting about 40 of those seats would go to students who may qualify for special education services. And the remaining 50-ish um, at-risk students being served in the Bright Beginnings program. So, Mrs. Larson, but they're not, the students are going through the process right yeah. now to be identified as special ed Correct. or not, and they've got to be placed first because we have to place those students by law, and that's why the other 40 at-risk students are sitting on the perimeter right now waiting to see what spaces are taken up by special ed students. Okay. Um, so we've heard talk of 231 that could be served. We've heard universal pre-K, which we do not know. We have a new administration coming into Richmond. We don't know where they stand on pre-K. They probably may stand differently than the federal government. Are you prepared um, in your operation budget with your teacher staff, are you prepared to serve another 231 students in the pre-K program? We would not be able to do that without additional resources. And, and if you look at the, the handout, we've tried to estimate just the personnel costs for adding 231 students is about 3.6 million. And the reason that's more than an elementary uh, school in terms of staffing, it, it's separate and above, is because we don't have teachers and aides for those 230 students right now. So the biggest cost our students is when you build an elementary school, you spread everybody out, you spread all the teachers out, you add the administration. When you, you do add spaces for kids who currently don't exist and are not in our system, you've got to add teachers and aides as well. 
and that's why the cost is, is slightly is more for for the pre-k additional students okay because that's you know that's one piece i think that we have not had that discussion are we prepared to bounce that budget up to support 231 more children um, in their pre-k program you know it's it sounds very good but we we haven't talked about that either because that has an impact on our budget um so and, I, and frankly i think that's a discussion we should have had before we even did the study so that we knew what we were willing to do um i you're, you've shown your your redistricting adverse i mean frankly you probably should be looking at redistricting jamestown to lafayette with the addition of the 900 building but you all have not wanted to do that um so you know the the reality is i don't i mean i as you know I mean, it was very tough redistricting that we went through. I'm sure some of you probably sat back and did not agree with some redistricting um, decisions that were made, but we made them, and they were not popular, and they were very tough, and community is not nice to you when you do that. Um, so I understand your, your hesitation about that. Um, also understand that in communities that are growing, redistricting some students are moving every year um, I, I don't think that's what we should be doing um, but I don't think that it's I, I think it's all in the way that we have to approach it as well though unlike my colleague I won't compare redistricting children <laughs> to redistricting voters um, <laughs> kids are a little different um, and so um, I know it's in a very emotional issue I get it um, but you know i think sometimes some redistricting has to be done and um also there was a comment made about the efficiency of schools schools are naturally inefficient anyway we don't use them the way that we should be using them um you know we ought to be filling them up at night with community college classes etc if we really wanted to get everything that we needed to get out of our school buildings but we don't do that. We use them for six hours a day. So um, I, I am very uncomfortable with the fact that we are deciding and telling you um, what you need to be doing when I, I would rather be much more comfortable as a board saying, this is the amount of money that we're going to give you and you need to decide how to best do that. Um, because I, you know, I'm, I'm a little frustrated that you're not willing to look at a separate pre-K building, but I realize that's, that's not my role. Um, so I would rather that our board has a discussion that says this is the amount of money that we're comfortable with giving to the school system for a capital project, um, which is ultimately what we're going to be doing. Um, because I guess I have a little PTSD from James Blair, frankly, and um, the stacks and stacks and stacks of paper um, that we went through study after study after study trying to prove that middle school was needed. So um, I would, I do hope though that we can drill down um, with the data. I do think that that's very important. I think that we need to look on our end about if we spend, if we give X amount now that we are hope, sounds like the majority of the Board of Supervisors would like to see that go to a pre-K building, when are we looking at a pre uh, elementary school? What does that mean um, with cost? I mean, I think we, we do have to have a um, full approach to, to cost and, and make sure that, there, that we are seeing some efficiencies. So um, I think that is it for right now. I guess I would I would just ask a follow up and just um, even though I said I, I wasn't my any of my business, but I am curious why the apprehension on a a, a standalone pre K building. I think the the board of the school board and I don't want to speak for them because they're here to speak for themselves today. But the we've always looked at a longer term solution. Uh, of an elementary school and because of the Anlar report then adding a pre-k to that I, I think bottom line from an administrative and student perspective 
we need space. And excellent teaching and learning can happen in many different spaces. Uh, and so I don't think there's a total aversion. I think there's the, the need for space will drive everything from an administrative perspective. We really are at that point. Um, redistricting, we will have to do it for either choice. So we'll be communicating to the community that we're going to redistrict all elementary schools for either two or three pre-K spaces or a new elementary school. And uh, that, that will be a very different type of communication. Most families will understand a new school. I think they may feel differently about pulling kids out of the school and creating two spaces to move every single elementary school around a little bit. And a lot of that redistricting will have to happen at the north of the county. Uh, starting with Stonehouse and pushing all kids south to a different location. So regardless of what we do, we, we need space. Regardless of what the solution is, we will be redistricting, and it's going to impact almost every elementary student. Yeah, when the renovations to the 900 building at Lafayette are complete, we, they will probably have to touch the third rail of redistricting there. But until you have new space, there's really no right. sense in rearranging the deck chairs right. on that. Um, we are running up against a timeline of our, from where we were, and some of us do have day jobs. Um, I got. Uh, yeah, this is this is Ted. I've got two. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm questions coming. on facility plan. Yeah, go ahead, Ted. And, and as do I. Ted, when you finish yours, I'll chime in as well. Okay, good. So, just from facilities planning standpoint, um, looking at the elementary campuses now, uh, how many of them have expansion capability? And if we were to translate that into uh, classrooms, whether they're additions or, or separate buildings, how many classrooms uh, does that give us uh, capability-wise total? And because to Jim's point, you know, maybe not limiting to two locations gets us the ability to sort of optimize costs, but also look at how do we keep uh, students closer to their neighborhoods? I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Keever or Mr. Snipes to jump in on that one. We have analyzed and look at, looked at all of the, the different sites. To keep kids close to their neighborhood, you would probably be having pre-K in every single elementary school, and that has never been our model. We've had a separate, highly uh, successful pre-K program that's been uh, administrated by a separate administrator with the qualifications to do so. Um, Mr. Kiever, Mr. Snipes, do you want to jump in on the potential of different sites of, on, a, on our elementary schools? Yes, ma'am. There, there was a, uh, a look a couple years back on the possibilities at, at various schools to be able to house um, additions. Um, I think that uh, obviously that would be a no at Matthew Whaley. I think we could take that off the table. Um, not notwithstanding JBB, CBB, Norge uh, would would be in that realm. Uh, the, the challenge though is with, with each of those facilities there are also some other um, conditions that would have to be met as you start to make renovations and building modifications. So having looked at all of the various sites over the last uh, several weeks again the two that we identified do have the space, do have some of the infrastructure in terms of bus loop and things like that, depending where an extra building would be relocated, would be located. Uh, and we also, if, they, if extra buildings are to be for pre-K, we are looking at one slightly south and slightly north of center so that the travel for students is minimized and controlled and that does not impact transportation. There are a lot of other costs we haven't even talked about today when you add 230 students to our roles uh, and transportation is one of them and the need for possibly for additional buses as well because it's like adding half a school. Uh, thank you. Caleb? Yep, thank you. Hi everyone. Um, Caleb tuning in virtually. Let me first thank Chris Williams for helping set up this, this virtual option and everyone who contributed to it. it it's worked exceedingly well. Um, 
So for me, I think Dr. Heron, your report demonstrated that there's a need at elementary schools. The AMLAR report, as we all know, demonstrated the need at pre-K facilities. As I try to think in the long term, I feel more comfortable with the first option, which is a construction of the elementary school, given that within five years at high enrollment, we'd be overcapacitated in our elementary schools. And in eight years, by fiscal year 2030, we would be overcapacitated. If we were to instead do the second option of moving towards pre-K facilities, one of my larger concerns is the ANLA report said that part of the, the hesitation, the constrictions on families enrolling their children, which may be eligible for pre-K, is simply the fact that geographically it might be hard for them to get there. So as I think about two wings or one demonstrated pre-K facility, given that Williamsburg's nine square miles, James City County's 179, it's still going to be difficult to find everyone who could be eligible for CDR or Bright Beginnings and, and put them into a pre-K facility. Whereas if we were to lower some of the capacity at our elementary schools by constructing a new one, as Mr. Hipple demonstrated, there could be more elementary, I'm sorry, pre-K students put into classrooms which were freed up in our providing for additional space at the elementary school level and freeing some up at the pre-K. So while I understand there's, there's need on both sides, thinking in the long term, it, it feels easier um, or better for us to go with option one to free up a space dim, uh, dispersed around the district for pre-K and provide for some of the, the elementary school needs, which as we saw, may be at 101% of capacity within five years. Thank you, Caleb. Uh, appreciate you guys uh, being able to come in virtually. It uh, works. It has worked pretty well. I have to get really well. I really appreciate that. Lisa? Thank you, Mr. Kelly. And I, if I also might say, sorry for the interruption, and, and thank you, Chris. Like John, I know I will need to, in about uh, 10 minutes, jump off for a day job obligation. So appreciate the option to tune in virtually. Lisa? Thank you. Uh, I uh, just wanted to make a couple comments and then respond to some other comments that were made. Um, I appreciate Ms. Larson's uh, point of view that uh, our superintendent is an educational leader and is recommending what she believes is, is the best educational option for our students. And um, to Ms. Larson's point, some, some communities, particularly up in Northern Virginia, do <coughs> redistrict every year. That's because they're building buildings that quickly. Um, we are not averse to redistricting. We have maps ready to go. Um, we have we have high school maps that are ready to go, which was just a minor little tweak. So as soon as we have space, to Mr. Kelly's point, um, they'll be redistricted. So we are we're not averse to that, and it's very clear that we will have to redistrict. And so I think having that conversation multiple times so that the community understands um, that that's coming down the pike is is what we're all trying to do. And then I just wanted to clarify that. Many people today have talked about pre-K as the immediate need, and um, I wanted to make it clear that it's actually elementary space that is the immediate need. Um, it was it was actually needed more like five years ago. And so, again, and I've said this for five years, the students that we're serving are the most vulnerable, more vulnerable, more special ed students, more English language learners, more economically disadvantaged. We need to have small group instruction space. So right now, it's our elementary kids who are being served behind shower curtains, under stairwells, um, in makeshift uh, teacher, designated teacher planning space. We've turned those into small group instruction space. So the immediate need is actually for our elementary students. Um, we do have preschool students that we could serve that are on a waiting list, but, but those students are not being served. Our, our most vulnerable students are being served in probably not the most efficient of ways. And, and I, I would, couldn't leave this meeting having anyone in the community thinking that there would ever be vacant space, ever. There would never be an elementary space that would sit and languish and not have children in it. Um, because ideally we could, in an, an ideal world, even lower class size even more. Um, the recession of 08 forced us, and Ms. Larson remembers these days, to bump up our student to teacher ratio. We, we've now looked at those targets, especially in the face of COVID and learning loss and demographic changes and we're doing what's best to meet the needs of our students, but we could do an even better job with more space. So we would never have space languishing um, and just needed to share that. Yeah, we never you. we never let a building go empty, man. <laughs> 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 Ms. Hummel? Um, Ms. Dunby said what I was gonna say about the redistricting. I, it's just a reset of the public's 
m mindset that we are going to be in this mode of redistricting. And as soon as building 900 is ready, uh, I think all of us are, are more than uh, up for the, the challenge that we will be facing to do the redistricting that needs to be done in order to alleviate some of the crowding in our high schools that are not quite in balance right now. So, thanks. Lisa and I in particular are very happy about that. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Dow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm a bit concerned because as I listen to the conversation, it seems like once again, we're split on what will happen, may happen. And if that's the case, we'll see that nothing happens. And that's my concern. It is true that Dr. Heron and her staff, they are the educational professionals here. And as the educational professionals here, they've given us a viable option, one that they can achieve in that option too. And I don't want that swept off the table um, because for, for various reasons. So I would just ask us to really consider this option too that Dr. Heron has presented and let's, let's actually do something. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think our I think our all collective goal is to do something, um, and I think we're all, you know, we just got to figure out what that do something is. Um, uh, the option number one has been from for a school. Um, option number two is also for the wings, and so the 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 as uh, Mr. Pons and others have said, you know, is the is a, a school would be a longer term solution to keep you from having to build two, and so it's it's all it's all a collective of what the funding partners are willing to willing to fund. So um, there's both sides of that story, but we, we, but I think our our all collective sense is we're going to do something. I I feel that way, Dr. Beers. Yeah, I just would reiterate that um, I. Uh, I do, I do respond. I, I do um, uh, feel confident that we can achieve uh, most of what we're we're trying to achieve with option two. Uh, it took me a long time to get to that. Um, I'm still concerned about the growth of our preschool population, and also uh, the number of children who are between the ages of three and five um, in our community. They're not all going to go to Hampton Roads Academy. Um, a lot of those kids are going to be coming into our school system. So I, I think um, uh, while um, uh, that option two, I think, is, is, is viable and, uh, and really important um, to try to do that as quickly as we can, but keeping in mind that farther on down the line, uh, we're going to have some, there's going to be additional pressures uh, to have um, more space and I, can I just make one other comment I talked to John McLennan about this yesterday uh, I said well you know John uh, if we go to option two that means we're going to have to redistrict and we know how popular that is in this particular community uh, nobody nobody comes out happy with however we come up with redistricting um, but I said but if it's but if we go with option two and um, it, um, and we support it, and the Board of Supervisors supports it, and City Council supports it, then when we start to get the heat for redistricting, um, I hope my colleagues in these various governing boards will step right up there and say, we really support this, and you're not going to take the heat alone. We're going to tell our constituents that we support this and this is the best way to go. So I don't get countless emails that are forwarded to me by members of our various governing bodies. It's okay to respond to those um, yourself and really that's, that's all I want to say. I'm trying to be a little humorous here. but. Um, um, it is a challenge, and uh, we all are working on this together, all of us around uh, around the room, and, uh, and we all take responsibility. And, and uh, I, for one, um, never shy away from uh, somebody's concern about redistricting. So I just wanted to uh, add that into the mix, but um, I think um, option two is um, I'm comfortable 
took me a long time to get there, but in terms of what we need to do now, um, and, and I certainly understand um, the uh, feelings of other um, other folks here in terms of uh, building that elementary school. I think we are going to have to build it. I just not quite sure we need to build it to start um, planning for that right at the moment. Uh, but we need to start planning for it fairly soon down the line. That's all. Ms. Sadler? Hi, yes, thanks. I just wanted to thank everyone for their comments today. I think it's been a learning experience for everyone. I too want to thank Chris Williams. He's a rock star. We're so blessed that Jason can't have him. He's, he's awesome. He's helped me so much over the past couple of years. Um, but I do um, I appreciate everyone's thoughts and, and ideas and opinions and concerns. I think with going with option two, in my humble opinion, it does take care of a couple of different things. It does take care of looking at the future needs, especially for our preschool children, our bright beginnings children, but it also does free up that much needed elementary space. So I think we accomplish a couple of things at the same time. And then we can start talking in the future when that time comes about our future needs, because as Mr. Eisenhower said, those numbers look fairly flat over the next however many years. But in, in those preschool kids coming up into elementary, I know fifth grade is only one grade level. However, we have to remember those kids are going to be moving up to a different school as well. So anyway, thanks. I do have to jump. I just wanted to thank everyone in closing. And I see Julie up there. So um, y'all have, a, I mean, I see Kira, sorry. Um, y'all have a great day. And um, I do have to run. Thank you so much. Mr. Kelly, can I just jump in really quickly um, with the, I just want to say something, I think everybody knows this, but just it hasn't been stated directly. If we do add classrooms to existing elementary campuses, um, those campuses will house more children than our, uh, than our middle schools. Uh, well, actually, let me, let me, instead of saying this is a statement, let me make this a question. Dr. Heron, can you, re can you tell us if we did add those spaces to ex those existing elementary school campuses, would those campuses be housing more children than our, than our middle schools and or maybe even compared to some of our high schools? So could you, could you educate us on that, please? It would certainly be, there would be more students on that campus than our middle schools, yes. Okay. All right. I'm trying to get us out of here. That's it. <laughs> I'll second that motion. Are there any other comments? That, uh, Just anyway? a thank you to you and Lisa for your service. Um, yeah. Especially you, Jim, having served with you. I know your passion, your wife's passion, long-term um, teacher of the year. I mean, you and your family have given a lot to the education of this community, and I really appreciate it. And um, you will be missed, as will you, Lisa. Thank you both. Thank you, Ruth. Appreciate that. Um, everybody, anybody have any other comments they want to add before that? It's been a it's been a pleasure to work with everybody, and uh, but I'm sure uh, Sarah in the back of the room there will do just fine. So, all that's all that's great. Um, we ready to go? Ready to go? All right. Um, without objection, William Bridge James C. School Board is uh, is adjourned. Okay. You want to go next? Uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? I move that City Council adjourn. Second. Second. Sandy, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Rogers. Ms. Ramsey. Aye. Mayor Fox. Aye. Vice Mayor Depp. Aye. Mr. Maslin. Aye. Good. All right. I'd like to also thank Chris and his team. I mean, you can see the wires around the, around the room. They, they spent better than six hours trying to set up for us and, and get this all put into place. So thank you, team. Great job and great representation of James City County. Um, I look for an adjournment until 5 p.m. on December 14, 2021 for a regular meeting. So moved. So moved. Ms. Steve, would you call roll, please? Sir, sure. Ms. Sadler. Gone. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Done. All right. Thank you all. Be Appreciate careful. It. Thank you all. <laughs>